I'm very honored to be here with everyone today. I've been at MIT for two and almost a half years, which makes me, I think, the uh, person on the panels today with the least amount of experience at MIT. Uh, but I think I've had the best experience with MIT. That's my subjective judgment. Of course, maybe all of us here would say we've had the best experience with MIT. But uh, it's been particularly unparalleled for me. The intellectual growth and excitement uh, has just been phenomenal. So let me tell you a little bit about my work, uh, about how I'm trying to uh, help us understand more about the role of ideas in global conflict. So I spent the last four years exploring the question, why do some Sunni Muslim clerics, these are religious elites, turn to preaching violent jihad for a living while well, most of them don't? So this isn't a question about foot soldiers uh, fighting for uh, ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra, the Al-Qaeda affiliate uh, in Syria right now. We actually know a fair amount about what radicalizes people like that and what motivates them to fight. We know surprisingly little about the religious leaders who apparently generate the ideas for these foot soldiers and fuel conflict. Uh, in fact, the assumption of most scholars is that there is uh, just a kind of endless supply of these elites who are willing to preach this stuff and drum up violence. Uh, and this references some of the theories that Roger was mentioning earlier about you know, elite manipulation of uh, kind of gullible or uh, at least easily whipped up populations. Now, I wish this were a problem, this problem of uh, elites adopting violent ideas and promoting conflict. I wish this were a problem that were going to go away, especially jihadism as a problem. But I think it's never been more pressing. I'm afraid to say it's not going away this year or next year, uh, no matter who wins the White House or what they tell you on the debates. So let me tell you a couple of things I've learned. First, do you know how many jihadist clerics there are? Or what percentage of the Muslim clerics in the world are jihadist? So this is a trick question. The answer is that nobody knows. And this is for two reasons. So first, to answer this question, you would need to collect a list of all Muslim clerics. Then you would need to comb through that list and find out which ones are jihadist just to get the base proportion of, you know, how many people we're talking about. Uh, the reason nobody has done this is because it's extremely hard. And I can tell you that it's hard because I spent the last three years trying to do this. So let me tell you about it. I won't bore you with the details, but basically I sucked up the entire Islamic internet, which takes a fair amount of computing space, chewed through it in a variety of ways, some statistical and some uh, me reading a lot of Islamic theology, uh, which you know, was not my forte when I started graduate school, um, and spit out a list. So the answer is that on the internet, as of about six months ago, there are 11,000 Muslim clerics who speak Arabic, or at least write in Arabic on the internet, uh, and have an active web presence. Uh, this may not mean that they're alive. It means that someone on the internet still likes them and posts their material, OK? Um, and actually, this then allows me to get at what is the number of jihadists. So it turns out 7% to a first approximation of Muslim clerics on the internet are jihadists. So why am I telling you this fact? So first, it is amazing to me, truly amazing. There have been literally thousands of books since 9-11 on the phenomenon of jihadism. And nobody has known in this entire time how many jihadist clerics there were or what percentage of Muslim clerics overall were jihadists. So when I think about what MIT is trying to contribute to the understanding of global conflict, I would say basic facts. <laughs> basic facts that are really, really, really hard to come by. Okay? The second reason I'm telling you this is that I think it's just about the most MIT thing ever to try to like suck up the internet and say, ah, you know what the answer is here? Analyze everything. We'll get all the data. Okay. So, let me get back to the question then of why these clerics turn to jihad. There's no simple answer. So we're talking about people's complex life paths here. But let me advance a couple of crude generalizations. There are two broad paths that I'm finding as I'm looking at the data. One that's received a lot of attention and may be familiar to you, and one that has not received a lot of attention. And that's the one I'm focusing on. First, let me give you some context that you need to know to understand these paths. 
When you try to understand the world of Muslim clerics, you should be thinking about them as academics. Okay, let me let this sink in for a little bit. I'm telling you that when you think about Osama bin Laden, you should think about a rogue wannabe assistant professor. <laughs> and you should not think about me, of course. There's no, no, no relation here. So I'm not arguing by analogy either here. This is actually an academic system. So of those 11,000 you know, people's profiles that I sucked up, I sampled and looked at the you know, biographies of a representative set. And about 50% are an academic in some way. They teach at a university. And 17% of them are assistant professors. This is literally the position that I hold here at MIT. So this is an academic system. Now, bin Laden obviously was not an assistant professor, but he's still affected by the academic culture of being a cleric. Um, you might ask yourself, well, what is bin Laden's most popular writing? Right, ask you that question, you might say something like, oh, his letter to the American people, right, which is this kind of pseudo fatwa on, you know, how you can declare war on him, et cetera. No, it's Taujihat Mahanjiya Rakam Wahid, which is views or considerations on methodology. Bin Laden has a three part methodology textbook. Okay, like how academic is that, right? It's not as good as Steve Van Evers' book um, on methods, and I don't think that my petition to get it assigned in Tepe Yamamoto's. Method sequence is going to go well, but this is an academic system. Okay, so that's the context. Let me tell you about these paths to jihad. The well-known one is one you've probably heard about. An angsty kid meets a radical preacher, becomes convinced, joins the jihadist movement, and then goes on to become a radical preacher themselves. So this is the story of Abu Muhammad al-Nektasi, who's probably the most influential living jihadist, uh, not because anyone in the US actually knows his name. In general, we don't, uh, but by citation counts. So this is an academic system, remember. Um, so what's his story? So when he's a kid, his local imam uh, turns out to be this uh, radical Muslim Brotherhood cleric who'd been exiled from Egypt. He decides he likes this. Then he decides that guy's not radical enough. He goes, finds another preacher, another preacher, et cetera. Then he eventually uh, goes to Saudi Arabia uh, because he can't find anyone quite radical enough. He goes to some uh, 14th century texts. Turns out they're radical enough. He then goes and fights in, Afga or in, uh, yeah, in Afghanistan. Uh, and he, he has this interesting line where he's like, I learned I was not a fighter, right? And so he becomes a, basically the jihadist equivalent of a professor um, and writes a theological text. So this story is pretty familiar if you know about the jihadist radicalization literature. Let me tell you about a different cleric, one that is, I think, no less influential. This is Nasser al-Fad. If you know about al-Qaeda, he's one of the top three clerics in al-Qaeda through uh, the late 90s and 2000s. His path to jihad is one you might not expect. So in the early 1990s, Nasr al-Fad is an up-and-coming star in Saudi Islamic legal academia. So he's gotten his PhD, and he's actually been hired by his own PhD granting institution directly out of the gate, right? Like, no, like, go away for a few years and find out if you're really good. Uh, but this is because he's just such an amazing scholar. Then what happens? So he's a little edgy, right? And I mean, I'm reading between the lines here, but it seems like he got a little, it was, it was blurry in Saudi Arabia what was, you know, what types of political dissent was, uh, were, were red lines at this point. He's a little full of himself. He starts taking political stands, uh, always risky for an assistant professor, and writes a poem insulting one of the prince's wives, right? So this lands him in prison at the same time as Saudi Arabia is imprisoning a bunch of Islamists, I mean, he's kind of a loosely Islamist. Uh, he is a professor of Sharia law, but um, he doesn't, he, he gets the harsh sentence that all of the Islamists got, but without the credibility of having gone to prison for being an Islamist. The Islamists in prison reject him. And they're all co-opted by the Saudi state. The Saudi state actually says, you know what? We need you guys after all. And brings them back in and puts them in these pseudo-academic positions, brings them back into the state. Lo and behold, you know, they all moderate. You know, that's half coercion, half persuasion, et cetera. You know, a lot of it, the persuasion of getting their jobs back. Nasr al-Fad is not given his job back. In fact, his uh, future in academia is absolutely closed. And lo and behold, he goes and becomes one of al-Qaeda's top clerics. He uses, so he's become very bitter about the state. They've shut off his uh, academic career, all of his ambitions to be a leading scholar of Islamic law have been dashed. Lo and behold, he takes his talents and goes and applies them for Al-Qaeda. So this is the pathway I'm focusing on. 
Uh, and it's a, it's a set of pathways. It's not just this you know, single story about the, the Saudi government putting you in prison and taking away your assistant professorship and your path to tenure. Uh, it's a series of places where academic ambitions of clerics are blocked. So I call this blocked ambition. And it can happen at a few places. So I find quantitative evidence that people with uh, fewer academic advisors in Islamic graduate school are more likely to go on to become jihadists because the job market for this is not meritocratic. And so people are relying on their connections to get them jobs. Uh, you know, I find things like the story I just told you. I find this in cases. I find it quantitatively in the you know, data set I sucked down. And I find evidence of this as well from ethnography that I did in Cairo at the al Azhar University. That's uh, the, one of the teaching mosques where a lot of these people get their PhDs uh, or equivalent. And now I'm trying to translate what I've found for both academic and policy audiences. So I'm not really sure how to conclude here. Uh, so I'll just say quickly that this is what I'm trying to contribute to our understanding of global conflict. And I think that MIT is absolutely the best place to do this kind of work. And I hope we do it uh, for another 50 years. Thank you.